Hello and welcome to Wising Arts Centre Studio Artists Live, our programme for young creatives running every week, every day this week as part of Discover Creative Careers. So it's an opportunity to speak to some of our artists here at Wising Arts Centre, find out how they work and discover some creative prompts. And we're live here on YouTube every day at 3pm and 5pm every day. So please do feel free to log into the chat here on YouTube and ask questions or add any comments in the chat as we go along. We've already had some questions in, but we'll also check through the chat and ask these during the session and when we get to the end. So today we're going to be hearing from artist Emma Smith. So welcome, Emma. Hello, really nice to see everyone today. Um, my name's Emma Smith and I have a social practice. Um, so I'm going to share some of what that means with you this afternoon. Um, so social practice basically means I work with people as part of what I do. Um, for me, who that is, is often about where I'm making the work. So maybe who lives locally to where I'm working. Um, but also I might have an idea for a work and there might be something I want to know about. And then I might think who might know about that or be interested to think about this thing or this idea with me. Um, my practice isn't just social in how I make it, it's also a theme. So I work with uh, the idea of relationships, how we're in relationship with each other. And in particular, I'm really interested in the ways that we're connected to one another without necessarily realising that we are. So hidden forms of connection between people. Another word that's often used to describe my practice is collaborative. Um, and again, this means doing something together and with people. So for me, a good collaboration is where you do something together that you couldn't do apart. An example of a collaboration in my work is Five Hertz, um, which is a project where I worked with academics to create and to invent a new language. Um, I worked with scientists to run experiments exploring the evolution of the human voice and how it can connect us with the intention being that we would make this new language that focuses on evoking empathy and friendship um, and that is a language that's understandable no matter what your own language is. The experiments we developed were in an art gallery which is where I would normally work and I wouldn't have been able to undertake the scientific elements of the work without the academics and they wouldn't have been able to run the experiments in the same way we did outside the lab and in a public space without me and so together we did something new that we couldn't have done on our own. It also opened up opportunities for the public to get involved and contribute to the research. So here you can see members of the public taking part in experiments to see how their brains respond to different languages. We're using a um, electroencephalography, which is like a sort of gaming technology, which um, sits on the brain and reads brain neural activity. And so you can also see here the public are then able to both contribute to the research process and be involved in that, um, but then also in the actual display of the work, the public are again invited to take part actively and learn the language. So this language is really, really simple. It literally has six sounds and the idea is you can be completely fluent in 10 minutes. So it's a very, very simple, simple process, but very effective. So when I'm coming up with ideas for projects, I try not to worry about if the thing I'm interested in is something I know about. If it's something I don't know much about, then working collaboratively means that I can then look for someone who does know about it and see if they're interested in working with me. So if you wanted to have a go working in this way, a really great place to start is with friends or family. And good collaborations really emerge from finding someone you really enjoy working with. So you can either start by thinking of someone you'd like to work with and who you think would like to work with you. Or you can start by thinking about something that interests you and then wondering who might know about it. So once you've found someone who's interested in creating something with you, have a chat and try to really listen to each other to understand each other's interests and knowledge and then put your heads together and see what you can come up with, thinking what can you do together that you couldn't do apart and that satisfies both your interests. And remember, you don't need to know what you're going to end up with to get started. You can just start experimenting and see where it takes you. So for me, making art involves a lot of reading and talking to people and finding things out and just trusting that at some point all those ideas will come together and I'll come up with what to make. But you have to just trust yourself to start this process before you know where it's going some of the time. So there are loads of interesting ways that we make sound and use the sound and the voice to create human connection. And this has been a real key interest to me in lots of my work over the last few years. And that sort of led into a real interest in music and music making 
that's not maybe to do with traditional ways of thinking about music and learning to professionally read or write music, but thinking about the soundscapes that surround us and how we might use them to create work, but also ways in which we all make music without thinking necessarily that it is music as such. So for example, in my project, The Whistling Orchestra, I bring together lots and lots of people who whistle at work and they wouldn't necessarily think of themselves as musicians, they just all love whistling and they do it all the time. And I brought them together to create a large orchestra where everybody whistles as it, with as if you know one section is a lunch, bunch of violins, one might be a oboe or other instruments, but everybody's just using what their body can do to make sound. Um, and I've created various orchestras in different places. And sometimes that's involved lots of people who can whistle. Sometimes there's people who really want to be involved who can't whistle, but maybe they're really good at clicking or humming or doing some other kind of body percussion that can feed into it. So it's always about thinking as well, how do you kind of involve people in the ways that people want to be involved and are able to be involved. But I often find with my work that one project leads on to the next. And so when I was making Five Hertz, I found when I got to the end of that, that I really wanted to make another piece of work, which is called Euphonia. And I wanted to really understand more about the way we use our voices musically. So this piece I worked with, again, lots of different people, academics who had particular expertise in the musicality of the voice, but also just members of the public um, and in, in fact, just people who were mates and who liked chatting. Because um, what we discovered was that when we chat with each other as mates, we produce amazing music and we do it completely subconsciously. So a good tip is next time you're in a room or on a Zoom chat with other people talking, just tune out a little bit as to what's actually being said and just listen to the notes that are being hit and the rhythms that are being made. And when there's a group of us together, two or more people, all of that starts to harmonize and interlock and actually make amazing, amazing music. And we just, all of us do it, but we have no idea that we are doing it. And, we, and it's, a, it's a process of being human and it's about making relationship together through our voices. And so this piece was really about exploring that. And it's a big sound work um, in a gallery where that all of these voices are from, that come from loads of different chats between friends across Liverpool, which is where this work was made, are then all, shared within the gallery space but the work itself can also respond to voices of the visitors coming into the space um, to have a conversation with you as a visitor. Another way of composing or thinking about music in ways that are not traditional music is maybe to use maths and that's something that I've also used as a way of composing. So I've written a number of scores for bells, uh, the church bells, various different types of bell, um, but, but towers that, bells that uh, hang in towers tend to be um, composed or rung to mathematical formula rather than to musical scores. So you won't talk about notes or what notes the bells are sounding, but just different sums that allow you to produce the bell sound. And it's just about how many different combinations you can create on a set of three bells. So if you've got three bells, if they were numbered one, two and three, your score might run one, two, three, one, three, two, two, one, three, two, three, one, three, one, two, three, two, one. And that's all of the combinations you can produce with three numbers together. With three bells, that's pretty simple. And you could do that with anything. You could bash a saucepan, you could find three objects of any kind and just think about them numerically and think what kind of combinations can you start to produce with different sounds. When you get into larger numbers, then the number of possibilities mathematically becomes astronomic. And so absolutely huge and just totally fascinating. So it's something that you can really play with and produce really complex scores through actually a really simple mathematical process. And like I said, you can do that with absolutely anything. So this doesn't need to be bells. This might be found objects anywhere around the home. And I'd really recommend thinking about really simple ways in which you can think about just recording noises and sounds from the spaces around you. There's loads of different apps that you can get for free and online on your phone or on your computer, which allow you to just record little bits that you hear that might be interesting once you start putting them together. Audacity is a great program that you can get as a free download for your computer to so start editing things together and play around with. Um, but just yeah, experiment and see and see where it goes. 
And I think that for me is really kind of what being an artist is, is just thinking about how you can just experiment, explore, think the world sideways a bit and just test things out. Um, so those are a few examples of some different um, projects and maybe we can have a little think about any questions that might be coming in. Great, thank you, Emma. It's really interesting to hear about how you work and often kind of incorporating different disciplines, whether that's science or whether that's gaming or whether that's maths into artwork as well. Do you think, I mean, yeah, do you think anyone can be an artist? Do you need to have any specific skills? I think everyone is an artist. I think that's important to kind of say, because I think art is something that's just fundamental to being human. And so I think we're all artists and being an artist then is just thinking about how much of your time you're able to give to thinking about it. Um, and so, yeah, the, I don't think it's an exclusion. I don't think anyone's excluded from the realm of being an artist. And I think for me, what's really exciting about it is it, the title artist for me gives a real liberation and freedom as to what you can do. And so there's loads of things that I do where I might look like I'm doing science or I might look like I'm doing research, I'm being a researcher, or I might look like I'm a bell ringer, um, or I might look like I'm a, a boat rower. There's all sorts of different things that kind of come into my practice that m mean that I'm also always doing some, some sort of other strange activity. But the reason I'm allowed to do all of that is because I'm an artist and that doesn't need to mean anything. And it can be a really freeing space where you can just explore whatever you want, but also not have to be confined by really specific ideas of how you do things. So often I find, for example, working with scientists, in order to produce a scientific proof or a result from an experiment, scientists will have quite rigorous processes that they have to follow that allows them to prove something. Whereas as an artist, we can go down a process of experimenting, exploring with something. And then I can think, well, hang on a minute, that I, I quite like to just think this sideways a little bit and there's something else that's a bit more curious that maybe is a bit of a bizarre question to ask at this point or a bit weird but actually that's totally fine because I'm not a scientist and so I'm allowed to ask that question and so I think it's just about it's just a, it to me it's just a free space where you can really explore. Thanks Emma so almost being an artist to you is almost about being curious asking odd questions and being able to incorporate or absorb lots of different things together it sounds like and you also mentioned about working with other people or, or collaborating as well could you talk a little bit more about some of the examples about how you might do that are you do you always make the sort of final work yourself or do you get other people involved really depends and on the projects making is definitely a big part of my practice and so but also I, I really enjoy working in lots of different materials and though, so that's why lots of my works are quite varied um, and so in the same way as I might come up with an idea and then just see where that goes when I'm thinking about what I'm going to make I'll get to the same point of thinking is this something I know how to make is it something that I want to know how to make and so sometimes it doesn't maybe I, I know that there's a piece that I really want to make but I don't really mind whether I make it or maybe the idea for the work means it's quite important that lots of people make it. And so then I'll think about how I can involve other people in working together and with me um, to make something. Other times I think, okay, I have no idea how to make this thing, but I'd really love to be able to. And so that's when I might think about whether there's someone I can speak to or a course I could go on or something I can do, looking up something online, whatever it is, to learn how to do that thing. And so it's also quite a, a regular thing for me in my work that I'll be learning new skills and techniques all the time, rather than feeling like as an artist, I know how to do it and I just keep doing that thing and perfecting it. I often will think, okay, now I really need to know how to sew or I really need to know how to um, sound edit or whatever it is that they're kind of constantly learning these different new new techniques so it's I guess also about just not being scared or worried that you don't know about how to do something and just trusting that that decision or feeling that I want to do that that's enough because then you can think okay well if I want to do it I'll go and do it then I'll go and figure out how to how to do it and learn how to do it and that's and that's fine. That sounds amazing that you're always learning rather than thinking 
oh no, I've got to be an expert in all these different areas and know how to do everything. But actually by bringing other people involved within the projects, you can also build your new skills, but also get different ideas going as well. And I think a lot of people think about artists as sort of maybe being working alone, maybe making a painting that they might sell and put on a wall or a sculpture, or even as a musician kind of creating um, an album or a record that might get streamed or, or sold as well, and that being the end product. And I wondered whether, um, because you work in quite a different way as an artist, and how do you actually make that work financially? Do you end up, do you sell any of your work? How, how do you actually make money from being an artist? Is that possible? So lots of the work that I make is actually ephemeral. So often, like with the Whistling Orchestra that I showed you, there might be something where I'm producing a performance. The important thing isn't necessarily to commercialise that or to sell it as a recording. It's all about having that experience together as a group of people and making something together and being there and, and, and doing it. Um, and so sometimes I might document a work, but there's not necessarily a... A physical thing that at the end of it um, that you would sell. Um, so I tend to make work by being commissioned by organisations to create events, to create performances, to create installations and exhibitions where I'm paid to create something rather than I create something and then I sell it. So there's these two way rounds of working as an artist where you can make something and then you can try and sell it or you can see if you can get into a position where you're being commissioned to make work and that involves going through processes of reaching out to galleries making contacts being making work and you know exploring so that you've got stuff to share and I think the more stuff that you kind of are doing and can share with people and say this is what I'm up to at the moment this is what I'm really interested in this is what I've been making um, and start to share that with people then that really helps. Thank you Emma that's quite insightful I think as well to understand that actually your ideas have not come from needing to sell things, but actually from just following what you're interested in and trusting that to an extent, and then being able to share that with different people so that eventually they'll actually pay you to do those interesting projects, work with different people, and it will grow from there and work in different ways. You, you mentioned it a little bit, but I wonder if you did have any tips for someone who might be interested in starting out either sort of starting to collaborate or being interested in sort of starting to explore sound as well. What would you say to them? Yeah, so I think in terms of collaborating, definitely a great place to start is thinking about existing networks, whether there's people who you know, or it could be like a friend of a friend. You know, we're all connected by very, very small number of people. Um, I've forgotten what the statistic is, but it's something like six people kind of separates you from pretty much everyone on the planet. So if you start thinking about, okay, this is what something I'm interested in. If there's not someone who immediately springs to mind that you might know about that or be interested in the, those things, I'm going to just ask around in my friendship group and say, does anyone know anybody that knows about this uh, and see what comes back. If um, it's always possible to look people up, and so as a professional working in the arts, I'm often actually quite ambitious in terms of thinking who I might work with. So when I'm working on an idea or developing something, I'll look up who are the, who are the world experts, who are the people who are really kind of pushing the boundaries on what this, this thinking might be around this idea and get in touch with them and say, hey, you know, do you want to work with me? And so always there's a possibility that people might say, well, no, no, I don't. Um, but actually, the more you do of this and the more, you know, once you get a get established if this was a form of practice that you actually develop in a long-term way people do start saying yeah I'd love, to, I'd love to be involved and I'd love to work with you and this sounds really exciting but I think it's always with working with anyone it's about thinking what are you both going to get from that relationship you know it's not just that you're saying oh can you help me do this it's thinking I can see that you're doing that and that's what you're interested in and I'm interested in these things and actually maybe there's a way that if we did something together it would make something which I thought was really exciting, but it would also make something that you think is really exciting. And so thinking about how you can do something that kind of works for everybody involved. So by actually sharing what you're doing, your interests, opening out those conversations, you might actually even discover new ideas and new opportunities as well. And actually maybe it's about, yeah, kind of being confident, embracing that risk that someone might not like it. Um, but most of the time, it sounds like people are actually quite interested to hear what's going on. Um, thank you, Emma. That's really great to hear from you and really exciting. And finally, I just wanted to ask you whether 
you always knew that you were going to be an artist or whether there was sort of one moment that sort of solidified it for you or how, how did you decide? Um, I, I was always told by my mum that I made stuff from about age two and didn't stop. Um, and I think, so I kind of, I, I do think I've kind of, in a cheesy way, just been making stuff. And I've always felt quite clear that that was what I was going to do. But to be honest, I have no idea why in that it's no one in my family is an artist. It's not, I've not had any sort of ex experience um, in my family background of people being artists. I just always really liked making and messing around. Um, and actually my work probably is much more um, research based now than it was ever when I was younger. So I think also like maybe things that you think you're interested in evolve. And so I always knew I was interested in making, but maybe the interest in researching and thinking about ideas is something that's that's grown. Yeah, thank you, Emma. It's interesting, kind of touching back on what we we're talking about at the start, that actually the different steps in your process as well, of whether it's involving other people, whether it's researching or whether it's actually making, these are all sort of different facets to being an artist, as well as actually organising things as well, that it's not always just your kind of creative inspiration or practically making something that makes you an artist. There are lots of different ways, I think, that you can, can do that. Some creative and some more practical or even organisational as well. Um, so thank you, Emma, for sharing some of your work with us, some tips and sharing your time as well. And thank you, everyone, for watching over YouTube. Just as a reminder, we are live every day this week um, at 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. So do join us for the rest of Discover Creative Careers Week. And if you haven't been able to join all of the sessions, then please do watch them back. They're now all available on the wisingbroadcast.art platform and on our YouTube channel as well. So we're back later on today with Olu, and I hope that you might be able to join us then at 5 p.m. So thank you, everybody, and hope to see you again soon. <laughs>